And hello everyone, this is the third episode of the Bian Conversation series in which we look at risks and opportunities for the basic income discussion worldwide raised by COVID. And um, really the spur to the series uh, was the sense that whilst we've seen um, a rise in interest in basic income in recent years, the phenomenon of COVID has really put basic income with it at the center of policy discussions and indeed public policy. Um, so, in the last uh, program, we had a feature on the United States, and this uh, week we are having uh, a focus on the case of Brazil. And let me just first of all introduce everyone. So, we have the three usual anchors myself, Jamie Cook is here in Scotland, Hi. and Sara Tawala in Hyderabad. And um, as our two uh, invited guests, we'll be bringing on uh, Leandro Ferreira, who is the uh, chair of the Brazilian Basic Income Network, uh, affiliate of Bien. And we will also have um, Professor of Welfare Economics of the University of Rio de Janeiro and member of the School of Social Sciences of the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, uh, Lena Navinas. Um, but before we bring on our guests, we will have a little bit of a discussion, uh, a little bit of a recap um, about um, uh, the recent events and, and the case of Brazil as we uh, place it in the context of the global debate. So Sarath, uh, Jamie, do you want to come in and uh, what are your impressions? Why do you think the Brazilian case, uh, what do you think it illustrates and why is it important at the, at the current time? Well, I, th I, I am really fascinated by the, the way this thing came about. Uh, the fact that it was a demand made by uh, a network of uh, uh, civil society organizations. And then in response to that, there was a major discussion and debate. And then they came out with, a, in fact, the, I, I believe they made a proposal. That's really fascinating, which is not the case in the US. US, it was just that part of the stimulus package. And then, so I'm really curious to see what is that actually happened? How mm. did it come about? And what are the long term implications? Mm. Mm. Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, um, Brazil is a country you always hear about as you start to learn about basic income. It's seen as a, a country that's been looking at this for a long time and played a, a critical role in debate. So I think there's a lot to be learned from programs that, that have been introduced there. Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned about that political and civic process of how you make progress, how you get ideas taken through. Uh, but also, I think and we, we've reflected on this in some of the previous uh, discussions, you know, we're seeing a lot of policies getting introduced just now. And a lot of them are getting called basic income, even if they're not actually basic income. So I think it's really, it'll be really interesting to hear from our guests actually what's happening in Brazil just now. And does it meet what we would consider to be the core components of a basic income? Or is it a different policy that's perhaps being uh, kind of given that as a, as a catch-all name, really? Yeah, and just to follow up on that, one of the reasons uh, we thought that Brazil was an interesting follow-on from the US is that when you look at the US and Brazil, there are at least some apparent similarities in terms of the way that a version, of course, it's not basic income, but, but schemes that look in some aspects like a basic income have been introduced as part of the response to COVID, which is, of course, why uh, people say that COVID has, has uh, generated opportunities for basic income. So in the United States, this comes in the form of, of an actual uniform cash grant, although it's means tested, it is a uniform cash grant, although it's temporary. And in, in Brazil, uh, you're seeing the same thing with the introduction on April the 2nd of uh, the so-called emergency workers aid program, although some people, as Lena will talk about later, really uh, tell us that we should look at that as an allowance rather than anything permanent. So for me, as someone who's worked on Brazil in the past uh, and uh, on the CCT schemes, the conditional cash transfer schemes introduced in Brazil, I've always had the sense that there's really a bit of a double-edged sword here because um, on the one hand, what you're seeing, some people say, is the introduction of a welfare state from below, the, uh, the state being concerned for the first time in some senses with um, uh, statutory rights of the poor. Uh, and this was a, this is a context behind the, the emergence of these schemes in the 1990s. But yet, on the other hand, you could also say that these schemes are in fact an adaptation to the new liberal structure adjustment that had been occurring in the past. And inherently, these schemes were unstable. They always had an exit uh, um, expectation of beneficiaries leaving the program. And they were uh, 
the levels of aid were, were set deliberately below subsistence so as to motivate work behavior and that kind of thing. So from my perspective, I've always had uh, been a bit skeptical in terms of thinking about a rights-based welfare state. On the other hand, there's been a lot of faith in CCT schemes and Brazil is the exemplary case as a route to basic income. So for me, it's really interesting. And I want to ask the two participants um, about this, how they see uh, what has been the, the, the response that has been generated as um, Sarat was saying, it looks on the one hand as though what we're seeing is a citizen's movement that has, in, that has um, successfully pressured a government into introducing something that looks a little bit like basic income. Uh, and yet on the other hand, is it the case that this is just populism? this is actually just a short-term fix and really has no connection with the legislative institutionalization of of uh, a new welfare state in brazil so these these are the sorts of questions uh, that i i hope uh, that uh, our participants will help shed light on whilst also talking a little bit about what's actually happened uh, in the context of of um, covid so um should we perhaps bring on our guests Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, and um, maybe we could ask uh, Leandro, first of all, as uh, chair of the Brazil Network, you've been heavily involved in uh, the movement that has pushed for the new program, the um, Emergency Workers Aid Program. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Hello, Louise. Hello, Jamie. Sarah, Lena. Hi. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with Bien uh, members and Bien discussions. It's, it feels like home for me, so it's great to discuss Brazil uh, scenario for now. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we had a huge uh, civic movement uh, that put a huge coalition together uh, for a, an emergency policy, uh, part of as an economic response uh, to the COVID crisis as elsewhere, but uh, the thing here is that this movement achieved uh, a high uh, capacity to influence the public agenda in the country. So uh, it's definitely something that uh, we take advantage from uh, to be in the social agenda now. Uh, so uh, the, the emergency benefit as it is, is not what we proposed in the beginning. Uh, we would have rather much rather have uh, something more like uh, those UBI policy or uh, similar policies that could enforce individual aspects, uh, unconditional aspects uh, of a benefit of a policy, uh, but uh, the emergency benefit as it is, uh, is what came out from the public agenda, especially in the National Congress. Uh, but of course, uh, part of our agenda was uh, proven right uh, during these discussions, especially because uh, it is so connected to previous policies or not, but the debate is, right? Uh, and that's what is going on right now, because uh, after the COVID uh, crisis, we might possibly have uh, important changes uh, in our social policy that involves uh, something very well known around the world that is Bolsa Familia. Uh, and at the same time, we have to take care of Bolsa Familia in order to not to be reduced uh, because we have a extreme right-wing uh, government that uh, wishes this from the very beginning. Uh, we also have to push for uh, cash transfers reforms and this coalition will push for reforms towards basic income-like policies guided by principles like those uh, in, in beyond uh, resolutions for being universal, unconditional, individual, regularly paid uh, and paid in cash rather than uh, in vouchers or in food baskets. Uh, we also have this here, uh, especially in local level. Uh, they tried to make this benefit a voucher in the beginning. They had something like they wanted to talk as, uh, as Corona voucher. Uh, but the public debate uh, got a much close concept uh, and public debate uh, uh, about the basic income. What I feel like is that uh, reaching 60 million people as it's doing now 
uh, is something that uh, is remarkable uh, as a response, uh, and it's only possible because of previous conditions. Uh, we can discuss if those previous conditions were fully, uh, uh, you know, used. Uh, but uh, we should we certainly have uh, enough people to make our hopes for universal uh, policies uh, increase, and uh, that's what we are pushing now uh, for this cash transfers reform that might take place from now on. Can I just ask one thing? When we come back to the program in the United States, our last conversation, Carl Waterquist, for example, uh, mentioned uh, what he thought was would be um, a very potentially very important uh, effect of some of these schemes is that when people feel or experience the entitlement, then somehow be locked in. And I think there is this emerging uh, assumption or hypothesis, uh, really. And I want to ask Lena about both of you about this. I mean, to what extent can we rely on this hypothesis that through the experience of these more universal, not universal, but more universal um, programs, that there will be a lock in of a sentiment of universality and expectation that this will uh, be institutionalized and there will be a lock in institutionally of the kind of scheme so it will become permanent. So this, this is kind of the assumption that there's a, a, there's a moral and an institutional lock in. My question would be, how many people in the population will need to be covered before this is actually realistic? And is it realistic? I'll just add uh, to your uh, question, Lena, uh, uh, Louise. Um, Leandro, I think in one of your interviews, you said that in Brazil, once you give something uh, as an income, you can never take it back. So, which, which has serious implications that once government stops this, is it going to, what does it mean? I think I, maybe at some point you can respond to that. Yeah, we can start by this because uh, pensions, for example, were taken uh, from people in the last reform, the recent reform. Uh, so it's not as we wish it, but certainly there is some path dependence uh, effect from the point of view of a policy, uh, from the point of view of in, an institutional path dependence, uh, but there's also path dependence on the results of the policy. And people want this uh, as uh, Bolsa Familia showed. Bolsonaro himself uh, tried uh, to uh, combat uh, the Bolsa Familia program during his 30 years uh, as a congressman and Bolsa Familia like programs, cash transfers in general. Uh, and now that he's a president, uh, he's paying uh, higher benefits uh, with for, for an increased number of people, uh, even more than the Workers' Party uh, government paid. So there's path dependence effect about this, and that's what we hope to happen uh, to the emergency benefit also, because somehow uh, the, the, the emergency benefit is a proxy for people that receive money at ultimately. So uh, people uh, that have money in their pockets, uh, they feel uh, like this is what is going to happen uh, once this is permanent. So uh, that's, the, that's what I call a proxy, and that's the positive effect of this uh, uh, transitional or emergency benefit, even though it's going to be uh, cut it in two months from now, uh, it's temporary, but it's certainly an opportunity uh, to discuss uh, that with people that have received. And I, I said that it's 60 million, 65 million people. It's a lot of people, far more than the Bolsa Familia. And it's a, an opportunity as we face here. And so now I'd like to ask Lena, would, would it not, could you not argue this is just uh, populism? And in fact, it's one of the uh, dark sides of populism will be potentially to undermine the case for basic income because uh, people will perceive this as an emergency uh, measure not co not connected with rights. Playing devil's advocate. You're muted, Devil. Lena. Yeah. You need to unmute your microphone. We still can't hear you. Can you unmute? Yeah. There we are. So good to be here with you. Thanks for organizing this talk on Brazil. I think it's really opportune because 
You see, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding about what is going on in Brazil. And it's not only now, it happened over the last years as well. So I think it's really great. And I think that it uh, raises issues about what, are, what is the role of a basic income within social protection systems. Because with the COVID-19, what we have seen is how important is to have a universal public healthcare system. That's the point. That's the, the bottom line of the discussion here. And I think it's very important to see that it was uh, the COVID-19 has very badly, has been very badly uh, mis, uh, has been mishandled in Brazil in the United States, in countries like the UK, where you have uh, defunded the, the um, healthcare system. So where did the coverage and the response to COVID-19 work better? In countries like Germany, like France, or even poor countries that reacted very quickly and invested a lot in preventing the spread of the disease. Uh, of the infection. So I think it's very important to integrate basic income into our social protection systems because they have been dismantled uh, during the last 30 years due to neoliberalism. That's the big point. And this is also why the idea of a basic income has become so popular. It's because of course, this is a very, let's say liberal approach just give money to people, let's give money to the poor, and then things will be solved. You see, they go to the market, they can take out loans, and they can, they, they can solve their problems. Let's not forget also that uh, today in the world, we have 2.5 billion people who receive uh, safety nets in the developing world. So I'm not talking about, you see, all the cash transfers we have, let's say, uh, child benefits, things like this, uh, family allowance we have in the developed countries. I'm talking just about the developing world, 2.5 billion. So it's not really a novelty because what new liberalism, but especially financialized capitalism needs is liquidity. And for the system to work, we need regular income schemes, uh, regular income streams. So it's very important to understand why the response is always providing more cash. So let me come back to something that is important for those who don't know. Brazil has, a very, has introduced a social security system back in 1988 with the new constitution. 68%, there was a huge increase in social spending in Brazil, but 68% of all social spending in Brazil takes the form of cash transfers, okay? We have 30 million people who receive pensions, 30 million plus 8 million uh, in the rural areas, plus uh, Bolsa Família with 14, uh, 14 million families. So we have a very large coverage. In Brazil, the poverty rate among the, the seniors is less than 2% because Brazil has provided a large cover in terms of pension benefits for the elderly in Brazil over 60 years old. And they all receive no less than one minimum wage. So we have to understand this because you see, it's not really a novelty because the constitution had guaranteed that even the elderly poor and uh, the disabled would receive a basic pension. And this basic pension is linked to the minimum wage, which has been um, uh, appreciated uh, over the last uh, 15 years. Not now, because we've been through a very severe crisis in Brazil. So 68% of all social spending in Brazil is cash transfers, okay? So how much do we spend with, for instance, uh, healthcare? So healthcare, the total, public spending, the three levels of government in Brazil is 3.8% of GDP. The federal government spends 1.5% only. And if we take pensions, uh, just public pensions, we spend 8.75% of GDP. The two um, anti-poverty programs we have, Bolsa Família and BPC, is 1.2% 
percent of GDP. It's almost the same we spend with our universal healthcare system. So in Brazil has a universal healthcare system, free, uh, universal, and uh, we spend the, the uh, private spending and the out of pocket spending is higher than the public spending, which is a contradiction, of course. Mm -hmm. So the point I would like to raise here is that there is nothing new in providing cash, temporary cash to people. This is exactly the way things work uh, exactly now under financialized capitalism, because it has been like this everywhere. And even the UN, when they established this idea of um, um, the uh, basic, uh, how do they call this uh, food? No, uh, there was a word for this. Uh, I forgot, it's just, you see, uh, guaranteeing uh, some uh, floors the the floors for everybody and most of it should also be again monetary transfers okay so this is not a novelty when the united states give one time one thousand two hundred dollars to all families below i think eleven thousand uh, dollars what is important to understand this is exactly what they do in the united states because they don't have a universal health care assessment for all uh, students here have a huge that uh, the students' debt is one trillion uh, five hundred billion dollars. Okay, so people are really in trouble here, and uh, lots of families are highly indebted because of this. So we have to kind of, uh, I, I think, contextualize what is going on, and then we have this huge crisis in capitalism. You see, which is really very, very. We've never seen anything happen similar before because we have a crisis a disruption on the demand side and on the supply side as well, okay? So can we solve the problems only by providing cash to people? I don't think so, because what we realize now is that, of course, we also need uh, to fill the gaps in terms of public provision for people. Look what's going on in the United States now that people will have um, uh, remote teaching, and they will have to pay the same tuition for having remote teaching. This is crazy. And so, of Anna, course, are, are we saying that the real problem here is the size and the structure of the fiscal state and the no, role it plays? I think it's the design. No, I think it's the design of mm. the social protection system because the idea, you see, we need to decommodify. The idea of social policy is to decommodify access. Of course, when you give money to people, uh, and then they don't need, for instance, uh, to accept, you see, uh, uh, indignified jobs in order to get some cash to buy their food. That's good. But if we are giving them money and then they have to buy uh, mm -hmm. private health insurance, that's mm -hmm. not a solution. So that's mm -hmm. the point, and I think it's important to keep this in mind. But what happened now in Brazil under Bolsonaro? Uh, so I will, I have a, uh, I disagree with um, uh, Leandro when he says that Bolsonaro agreed to expand Bolsa Família. It's not true because in December 2019, we knew that uh, the poverty rates increased substantially because after three years of very low economic growth rate, around 1%, there was uh, mounting poverty in Brazil and they reduced the coverage we know that they have reduced the coverage because he was not trying to, to improve it, quite the contrary. They were trying to uh, control, impose more means tests and reduce the coverage because Bolsonaro was saying, ah, these guys, they are uh, defrauding the program. There are lots of people who should not receive it. And I, 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 I think that Leandro agrees with me that this was uh, totally, what was happening. I totally agree with this. Okay, <laughs> but this is not exactly what you said. But, so what, why all of a sudden, you see, we, we accept this idea. Of course, Bolsonaro was with the mishandling of the COVID-19 losing ground. And of course, we have a ultra liberal minister of the economy in Brazil. The guy who worked with the Chicago boys under Pinochet. We have to understand who is this guy. Okay, the guy, he wants to give vouchers to everybody. Now he wants to provide a 250 reais, which is around $145 per month 
uh, to poor families, two million children for them to buy uh, daycare. Okay, but of course we know what is the logic behind this because they don't regulate the price of daycare. And of course, if you give a voucher and if you don't regulate the price, the price yeah. go up and then we discriminate taxes. As we know, as it happened in different countries, especially in Chile. But my question is, we, Brazil is the only country, and Brazil is always an exception, <laughs> that introduced a true UBI uh, in uh, 2004. So my point is, uh, 24 hours prior to the adoption of Bolsa Familia, we passed the law, and this law remained that letter and unknown for most Brazilians. In 2014, I carried out a national survey, and we asked Brazilians, would you agree uh, to have not a Bolsa Familia, but replace the Bolsa Familia by uh, universal basic income? 51% were against, because for people in Brazil, you cannot give the same for everybody because we have the very rich and the very poor sometimes are not deserving poor. So you see, Brazil is a very unequal society. We have to understand also that we haven't been through this reckoning of our, you see, colonial past with a lot of discrimination and things like this. So the point is why, despite the existence of a law on UBI, activists, progressive parties, and members of Congress choose the easiest way out by passing the already existing institutional framework. They prefer transitory and short-term rules rather than rescuing the law. This strategy, for me, further debilitated the social security system because it continues the defunding. In addition, it did not help to make sense of what a UBI is for the public opinion. So my point is, why we did not rescue a law that has been put in a drawer for 16 years now? That's the point. Okay, we have institutions. Should we care about our institutions? Well, the answer is simple. The answer is that all of these programs have been implemented in the context of uh, lockdown. So they are essentially justified in relation to the oh. fact that people should, uh, are unable to work. So no, that, but that the point is, let's start implementing this program. But mm. you see, uh, what uh, the, the cost of this program now, it's around one, 150 billion reais. Mm. Okay, it's five times more than the Bolsa Familia. Mm. But in two months' time, the mm. minister is trying to implement a new uh, reform of social policy and social security in Brazil. Mm. And they will suppress lots of different uh, workers' rights, like unemployment benefits, like uh, uh, job allowances, and so on and so forth, because they think, ah, you see, these guys are receiving privileges. No, these are the former workers mm -hmm. who, who correspond to half of the Brazilian labor market. Mm -hmm. It's around 50 million, 55 uh, million, 60 million people, okay? So we will suppress uh, their rights and the government decided that they will now introduce one uh, Let's say it's called the uh, Brazil income. Okay, the, the, they will end up also with both the family and everything will be merged into one single cash transfer program. Okay, for around they think 50 57 million people more or less what they're covering now, but it will be done destroying workers' rights, destroying benefits that are um, drafted by the Constitution, so we are destroying our democratic institutions, and also we will reduce the coverage and we, all, we will also reduce the, the spending, the cost, because now we are spending 150 billion, and soon we're going to be spending 54 billion, so it's one third of what we are receiving now. And the, the, the benefit will be reduced from 600 reais to 232 reais. So we have to understand the context in which these initiatives are taking place. Because it's not just, you see, once and for all, we're gonna give, you see, uh, cash transfer for 60 million people, and then 
it's finished, we go back to what we had in the past. No, we are destroying not only uh, the uh, benefit programs we had and that were linked to contributions, but on top of that, we are destroying our healthcare system, we are destroying our pension system, we are destroying our educational system, which is public. So this yeah. is important to understand what's, what is at stake in Brazil. Yeah. Can I come back to Leandro, just uh, maybe um, perhaps uh, Sarat, you also want to come in. I'll very quickly ask uh, the question in that case. Um, I mean, is it possible to separate these things out and say that taking a more positive perspective, the new, the experience of going through this, this more universal payment to this new system, is it necessarily um, negative in the sense that it could build on Bolsa Familia and um, extend an entitlement approach uh, in Brazil in the same way that you've had in the rural pension, which has been very stable and, as you say, very efficacious for seniors? Sure. Is it not possible uh, that it could happen uh, through the new scheme, even though it's an unintended effect, it could happen? Yeah, that's a risk. Uh, but <clears throat> Bolsa Familia itself was a merging uh, strategy uh, for multiple minimum income schemes. Uh, so uh, the Bolsa Familia uh, top up uh, benefits paid by uh, a number of minimum income schemes. And uh, what I feel like is that uh, more than uh, not implementing the basic income law from 2004, uh, we did not uh, create a, uh, an additional strategic, strategic uh, movement to keep the merging process uh, on, uh, but always topping up the benefits. Uh, what is happening now, as Lena mentioned, is that they are trying to merge things in order to reduce this, not topping up, but bottoming things down. So uh, that's, the, that's the risk, uh, but that's something that is happening, not because of the emergency benefit, Lena. I think you also agree with that because uh, those cash transfers reforms uh, they were taking place in Brazil before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the, the in Brazil, they call it, it's very strange, but it's a Brazil income program that they want to replace Bolsa Familia. It was being discussed before the crisis. Uh, pensions were reformed before the crisis. But now we have a strong movement uh, that uh, conquered part of what is happening here and we, we, are, we are back to the table uh, in this discussion. If but we had... Uh, sorry, if that's we had what Bolsonaro dangerous along, for the basic income movement globally, because what you're describing has happened in Europe. In Europe, what you have benefit unification comes uh -huh. along with benefit ceilings, and it comes yeah. along with essentially a leveling down of the generosity of the payments that people receive. So I agree with you, it happened before Corona. And, but, but what the danger of Corona is that now you have a, the legitimacy to do this, to somehow uh, incorporate the defense of basic income along this sort of leveling down, yes. um, in this leveling down approach, which is yes. indeed, as Lena is saying, is part and parcel of the rollout or the next phase of the neoliberal, neoliberal global marketization. We have a place in the table now. That's what I think, Lena. You're correct when you mention uh, this context process that is taking place, but this is taking place uh, from 2015 uh, to now. It's not because of the coronavirus uh, crisis, not because of the emergency benefit. The emergency benefit created a political opportunity for us uh, to go back to the discussions uh, in, in a great condition, uh, including to avoid, uh, you know, uh, negative effects of this. Uh, so, of course, the emergency benefit has a lot of institutional problems, uh, like, for example, not using database uh, from uh, multiple uh, instruments that the government already has. They created uh, something related to a public bank that people have to go online. That's creepy. Uh, people uh, have their dignity stolen by a nap in their cell phone, uh, but that is also an opportunity to, you know, say that public ba public banks are important in our contest, and this was proven during this coronavirus crisis. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's the same for the the cash transfers in general, and we are back to the table thanks to this.
Thank you, Leandro. Sarat, you wanted to come in. Yeah, uh, before Lena comes in, I just wanted to ask Leandro, some of the issues uh, uh, raised by Lena earlier, uh, when all these organizations came together to make a demand, what kind of discussions happened? What kind of uh, skepticism was there internally about are we walking into something that we shouldn't be walking into? I mean, what was the consensus? Were there differences internally? Because some of the questions raised by um, Lena are quite fundamental questions about the entire social security system. I just wanted to know the process of this movement. Yeah, we have uh, extremely different uh, movements uh, in this coalition. We have uh, landless people movement and we have uh, entrepreneurs uh, concerned about social responsibility uh, organizations and uh, some of them are very formal and uh, really uh, widespread nationally, others are very local. Uh, but uh, what we had uh, is uh, the concern to make people uh, protected uh, regardless of the effect that was uh, coming. Uh, it was March, so we didn't know yet for how long it would last, uh, but we uh, considered that it was important to last as long as the pandemic uh, would last. So this was a consensus, the first consensus. Uh, the other is that uh, Bolsa Familia was important and it was, it was something that we could take advantage from uh, including our instruments, for example, the Unified Registry for the Federal Government Social Policy. Uh, it was something that was considered really important and as a reference uh, to formulate what we wanted. Uh, so uh, those kind of things were being very uh, long, uh, has, have been long discussed in Brazil in academic circles, uh, in research, in public debate, and we really took advantage of this. No one says uh, absurd things about Bolso Familia anymore, not even Bolsonaro, that's what I'm trying to say. He, he, put, uh, he cutted a lot of people uh, from the program, but not uh, what, he, what, what was expected. Uh, if you follow his uh, congressman uh, historical approach to this, for example. Uh, so that's uh, what we were building up uh, as a consensus in this coalition until we go to the Congress uh, arena because uh, from the very beginning the executive branch was never opened to discussions and everyone agreed uh, we should have uh, we should have an, a, 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 an approach to the National Congress on behalf of those organizations that that was really effective. Lena, did you want to come in? Yeah, I think that first, you see, when we created Bolsa Familia back in 2004, 24 hours after we created the law on basic income, uh, the idea was to provide a safety net to the majority of the poor, because uh, under the constitution, those who were protected by social assistance were only the elderly and the disabled, okay? so adults and children were completely abandoned. So it was very important. But of course, we kept Bolsa Familia very limited in terms of the poverty threshold, which is still today below $1.9 to $1 a day. And uh, you see all the measures we have adopted under the Workers' Party for five years, they did not uh, index uh, the benefit to the inflation, to past inflation. So you see, the way they handled also the Bolsa Familia was extremely, I think, um, neglectful. Uh, you see, the way it, it, it was, there was a neglect because it was something really marginal. So what I think would be the good opportunity now, because Bolsa Familia and social assistance are both uh, part of our social protection system, okay? It's inscribed in the constitution. So what we've been seeing over the last 10 years is the dismantling of social systems, social protection, not only in Brazil, but forcefully also in Brazil, because we had, you see, after the Workers' Party 
we have kind of uh, uh, an, an, uh, the, the way uh, we, we are trying to destroy the social state is, is absolutely violent. It's something really very disruptive, okay? When we read Wendy Brown's book on the in the ruins of neoliberalism, this is exactly what is going on in Brazil. It's very impressive because it's exactly what is going on. So the point is, consider, con given that we were defunding the social protection system, that uh, it has been underfinanced for 30 years, that they diverted uh, resources that are exclusive resources because we have an exclusive budget for our social security system. What we should have done, in my opinion, the opportunity was to, uh, again, uh, reinforce our social security institution, our social security programs, because they are legal. We, can, we build this, uh, let's say, this democratic institutions in 88, 30 years ago. You see, it's, it's pretty young. It's something that is still very new. So in my opinion, we should have taken this opportunity and say, okay, nobody can live with 200 reais per month because this is the average uh, benefit, the average stipend uh, paid by Bolsa Familia. Let's increase it to 600. I made this proposal. Okay, because we would be at the same time, what would we be doing? We would be in strengthening, reinforcing our, uh, let's say, constitutional programs that were at stake because they are at stake by definancing, by underfinancing, by diverting, uh, you see, resources that are oriented to those programs. So we could have increased the Bolsa Familia benefit 200 to 600. It, it's a law and according to the constitution in Brazil, you can never <coughs> reduce uh, a benefit that because according to the constitution, this is forbidden, okay? Nobody can have uh, pensions and things like this, reduce it. For instance, the minimum will be guaranteed by yeah, the once, minimum. Once they are entitled, right? Once they are entitled. I'm sorry? Once they, are once, they are, once they are entitled to that benefit, they, it cannot be reduced. No, but the benefit can be reduced. So if we have increased the Bolsa Familia from 200 to 600, that would be great. And then we could have said, let's change what, because the Bolsa Familia is not uh, a constitutional right still in Brazil. So it's also at risk. It has always been at risk. So let's make it a constitutional right. And then let's also change the qualifying, you see the criteria for qualifying, let's increase. So we would have improved Bolsa Familia, we would have expanded Bolsa Familia, we would have valued Bolsa Familia. Now what's gonna happen with this temporary program in two months from now, the, the people uh, uh, who are recipients of Bolsa Familia and are receiving for three, four months, 600 reais, they will go back to 200. So is this acceptable? This is not acceptable. So there is a problem in the strategy for me because I think that we should have taken this opportunity to improve, to enhance, and to rescue our law on basic income. That's okay. the point. Thank you very much. That is a very interesting point at which I think we'll have to end and just have some last words um, from uh, everyone. Uh, what I just want to say is that we will, I think, um, provide a transcript uh, of all of these recordings and we will also provide readings that are relevant to follow up on some of the things that have been um, discussed. So fascinating stuff. Um, personally, I took away from this the very, the, the essence, the importance of institutionalizing rights and, and the ways, I mean, in, in many ways, I think Brazil is actually quite a, a long way along the way, but you can also regress and we've seen regression in recent years. But on the other hand, I think a lot of what was said by um, uh, Leandro uh, gives some ground for optimism. It's not too late to follow your strategy, Lena. Yes. Um, yeah. Too late. Yeah. Do you want to have just a round off and, and then Lena yeah. and Jamie. Leandro. Yeah, Leandro. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. It's great. Uh, I, I always, Lena is associated to the Brazilian Basic Income Network. So 
her opinion is really important to guide uh, what the president of the Brazilian base can, uh, in case, in this case, that's me, uh, what I do here uh, and how I push for a basic income. Uh, we take a lot of advantage from this experience. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the coronavirus crisis, uh, it brought us uh, an opportunity to make public outreach about uh, basic income uh, a strong thing. Uh, I would not even say again, but it's a continuous movement. Everywhere I go, I try to remember that uh, it was coming back to the public agenda before the crisis. Uh, we had a rush uh, for basic income because of uh, the future of work uh, concerns that are uh, being uh, you know, discussed around the world. Uh, and now uh, the coronavirus anticipated this crisis uh, as it could as it, as it may have anticipated also the uh, environmental crisis, for example. So uh, the 21st uh, century will be a global uh, crisis century. Uh, we have to be prepared for this and basic income might be uh, a social protection against this kind of crisis, uh, this kind of changes, and we have to be prepared. I think that uh, the crisis, uh, you know, put it, uh, anticipated our challenge for this uh, and created a lot of uh, muscles uh, for the basic income movement uh, to be part of these discussions. Otherwise, uh, I see something that would be uh, more regretful in terms of protection, uh, in terms of coverage, in terms of generosity and so on. So uh, it's an opportunity as I see it. Uh, and in Brazil, we are uh, preparing ourselves to uh, rush for uh, cash transfers reforms and political reform in Brazil. Otherwise, we won't have something that belongs to everyone. Uh, we have to change our politics also uh, because policy, you know, it's, it derives from uh, our, our politics itself. So thank you. It's an opportunity. And I hope to see you in person uh, really soon, maybe in Glasgow. Uh, but really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any, any short comments, Sarah, uh, Lena, and Jamie? No, I mean I would uh, leave the last few minutes to Lena because it's uh, this is really a very interesting uh, two perspectives we have and uh, equally robust. And uh, for uh, India, there's a lot of takeaways. Okay, Lena, to you. Over to you. Uh, yeah, uh, before. Yeah, yeah, Jamie, because we haven't heard Jamie. Jamie. Today. Jamie. Yeah, Again, very quickly, I, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I think it shows, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, what happens in Brazil is so important and is such a, an area of learning, but also shows we need to know more. It's, it's very easy to see the superficial kind of top levels. Uh, and I think also just reinforces something we've discussed on previous shows, which is about that importance of language and description. Because actually what we're seeing in this crisis are some you know, quite nasty hard right leaders who are suddenly finding lots of money to throw at things, but do at the same time undermining those protections that we've been looking for. And I yeah. think the real challenge for us who support basic income to navigate that path uh, between the two. So, you know, I, I think for us in Scotland and elsewhere, there's a lot we can uh, we can learn from both of you, and hopefully we can keep those uh, conversations going. Um, Lena. So uh, it was great. It's uh, it's a pity because uh, we need that uh, twice as much time here to continue discussing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I'd like to make uh, some final points. We cannot dissociate basic income from from universal public provision. Okay, because everything has been again commodified, and not only commodified but financialized, and we have to understand what is financialized capitalism, how it works. It's not by accident if the United States set up a, a three trillion uh, rescue program, okay, with credit, just credit lines, three trillion. Look at the European Union, 500 billion. They never did this in their lives. So it's completely unique because of course, you see, we need more than ever liquidity because this is the way you see capitalism works now, etc. Are we really pushing for uh, 
the creation of new jobs? I'm not sure because of course, the credit lines were not conditioned on anything like in, in the 2008 crisis. So we're doing exactly the same, just giving money and see what happens. But let me go back to Brazil. When I give $40 a month to 60 million people, this, co this corresponds to three times, it's three times higher than the federal spending in 2019 with the Brazilian entire public health care system. Okay, and look what is going on with the COVID-19. Uh, ICU beds in Brazil, we have five ICU beds in the private sector and just one for every five ICU beds in the private sector, in the private hospitals, we have one in the public sector. So us, uh, doctors, um, he uh, healthcare workers, and people who really uh, are involved, activists in protecting the, our public healthcare system because we created it uh, uh, inspired by the NHS in the UK. Okay, we launched a campaign and the campaign consisted in putting up, creating a pool of ICU beds, okay? And this pool of ICU beds should uh, allow a public entity to better redistribute uh, the ICU beds because they were underutilized in the private sector. And of course, there were waiting lists of thousands of people in the public sector. Did it work? No, we failed. Of course, because the banks did not accept it, the insurance did not accept it, middle classes did not accept it, okay? So we have to understand what is this country? Because if in a pandemic like the COVID-19, 68,000 uh, deaths and 1,700,000 1. uh, confirmed cases, and it's still going on 50,000 new cases a day, and people don't want to pull resources together to share them and you have a more rational utilization of those resources because we have to keep what is private, you see, separate from the people. Okay, so what can I expect from this country? We have just passed a law in the same Congress last week, privatization, full privatization of water and sanitation in Brazil. Okay, give money to people and then they will give the money to whom? To the private companies, international companies who are coming to privatize water and to provide private sanitation. 25 million people in Brazil don't have running water. 50 million people don't have adequate sanitation. So let me ask you a question. This is the same Congress who passed the Emergency Workers Allowance Bill. Do you trust this, this, this Congress? I don't trust this Congress because even the left voted, even part of the left vote for it. Okay, so don't talk about giving money to people if we're not able to really decommodify access and universalize opportunities through public education, public health care, public security, because you see the rich, they are protected, the poor, they are killed every day in the, in the slums. So excuse me, either we are smart enough to build a strategy that compounds, you see, that really uh, puts together uh, basic income and a, a relative significant amount and the decommodification of everything, I'm gonna tell you it's gonna be dramatic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Finish off. This is exactly what we talked about in the first episodes, the opportunities and the risks. And the, the risks are to decontextualize basic income, just as we are focusing on it. It's a paradox, but it's a very real one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Lena. Thank you, Leandro. Bye-bye.